Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar on what exporters need to know about VAT when selling overseas. My name is William Barnes-Graham, and I am the Digital Content Manager at open to export We are an online community helping small UK businesses get ready to sell overseas. To our step-by-step -step articles and guides, regular webinars, our export action plan tool, and our quarterly competitions. You can find all of these on our website at www.opentoexport.com. Open to Export is powered by the Institute of Export and International Trade, the UK's only professional membership body for traders, offering a unique range of individual and business membership benefits, education and training catering for beginners through to master's degrees, and an always exciting and prestigious program of events celebrating UK businesses' exporting achievements. We will be running a live Q&A at the end of the session, and you can ask questions at any point during this webinar using the question box on the control panel to the right-hand side of your screen. We should hope, hopefully have a little more time than usual for questions today, so please feel free to make the most of that. Speaking on today's webinar, we'll have Claire Taylor, the CEO and founder of simplyvat.com who are formed to help e-businesses trade internationally and successfully without being burdened by complex VAT legislation. Claire is also supporting the Institute with her new series of bite-sized online learning modules on VAT, which she will also introduce a little bit as well. But without further ado, over to you, Claire. Hi, William. Thank you very much for having me. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for your time this afternoon. Um, at Simply VAT, we provide international VAT compliance services, and I'm here today to um, give you information on what you might need to know about the rules and regulations surrounding VAT when you're trading internationally. Um, if you can turn the slide, please. So, um, obviously, selling abroad. Um, there is more to think about than if you were just selling locally. There's the obvious language differences and the not so obvious cultural nuances, um, such as cultural differences in payment method preferences. For example, the Germans like a bank transfer, whereas here in the UK, we much prefer our PayPal accounts and debit cards. And then, of course, there's the rules and regulations surrounding international VAT. Um, we find people don't even know they have an international VAT obligation or indeed they don't want to know so it really is all about the education next slide please so we met with many responses um, when you start talking about international VAT um, and one common one is head down in the sand and this can work for a while but it really is is not a permanent solution in this day and age so actually what do you need to think about and um, obviously because you're here on the webinar, you're, you're really ahead of the game and you're going to breathe kind of life and longevity into your businesses. Next slide, please. So firstly, I just want to put um, today's presentation in perspective. Everything I speak about is as the rules stand now pre-Brexit. Um, I, I will touch on how things will probably change as we're getting more and more information towards the end of the presentation, but be aware these are the rules and regulations now. So without further ado, um, there really is some basic questions that need to be asked which give really clues to what VAT treatments apply when you're selling, when you're selling abroad. Um, these are what are you selling? Are you selling a goods or service? Who are you selling to? a business or a consumer, and where are your customers? Are they inside the EU or outside the EU? Now I'm gonna talk through these different scenarios, really high level. It's obviously a dry subject, it's quite technical, um, but I understand from William, you'll get a copy of the recording and we can give you the slides and you can contact us afterwards should anything be unclear. There's quite a lot to kind of um, try and cover in a presentation like this, but what I really want to do is get you thinking, give you kind of signposts for when you actually might realise you've got obligations or not, or how you actually deal with about obligations. So it is a high level presentation, but there's resources um, at your fingertips afterwards. Next slide, please. So firstly, we're going to look at selling services to businesses inside the EU. 
Um, now, the supply of services is covered by the general rule. Now, if both companies, the supplier and the customer, are VAT registered, the services would be taxable where the customer is. So if the seller um, is supplying a business, the seller needs to obtain a valid VAT number from the customer. Um, and in order to make sure it is valid, you can check on a European Commission website called VIES, V-I-E-S. Here you can key in the VAT number and it will tell you if the customer has a valid VAT number. There's some countries like Italy and Spain where they don't, the, the, the number doesn't always show up on VISE because of the way their processes are set up. If this happens, go to the customer and ask them for a, um, a VAT certificate. So you check you've got a valid VAT number and um, you put it on your invoice along with an obligatory phrase um, stating the customer accounts for the VAT under the reverse charge. As a seller, you also must complete an EC sales list for the tax authority and the customer accounts for the VAT as both input and output on their VAT return. Um, if a supplier isn't VAT registered, which can happen obviously in the UK, we have a high local threshold of £85,000. If you're not VAT registered as a supplier, it is not a VATable transaction and does not need to be recorded anywhere. There's no mechanism to apply the VAT. There are, of course, exceptions to the rules. Namely, you may need to VAT register and account for um, local VAT in the country of supply when it comes to land-related services, events and conferences, etc. But it really is about um, having that conversation and knowing what rules your supply of services triggers. Next slide, please. So um, now we're looking at selling services to um, private consumers. So um, these suppliers are in general subject to VAT in the country where the supplier has its place of establishment. Again, there are exceptions to the rules, for example, services relating to um, immovable property. The services are subject to VAT in the country where the property is located and things like cultural, artistic, sporting activities, for example, if you're a tourist in Spain wanting to go and watch Barcelona play football, the ticket's going to contain Spanish VAT. Um, now, these rules differ if you're supplying um, e-services to private consumers. So be aware that usually if you're supplying services to um, non-e services to consumers, the supplier, um, the VAT is in the country where the supplier is established. Next slide, please. So it differs from selling e-services to private consumers. The rules changed um, three years ago, which, is, which has flown by. If you're selling broadcasting, telecommunications and electronic services to consumers, um, the new rules it were introduced on the 1st of January 2015, and it was a fundamental change. Instead of VAT being accounted for where the supplier is, VAT is charged now where the consumer resides. So you as the supplier, it's your responsibility to collect all the information, know where your customer is, apply the VAT rates of that country where your customer is, and obtain um, IP addresses, um, credit card billing information to be able to prove that your customer is in that country. Now, there is really good software out there like Taxamo and Quaderno, which you can plug in to your online store where people would download your products, your say your antivirus software, music, games, etc., And the software does the hard work for you. It, it identifies where the customer is, applies the VAT rate and collects the relevant um, audit information for the tax authorities. Now, once you have this information, it needs to be given to the relevant tax authority. Now, there's two ways of doing this. You can either register locally in the, in the countries where your customers are, um, or you can use the VAT mini one-stop shop. And the mini one-stop shop was introduced to stop you having to register in multiple locations. Um, it's designed to make the process easier. So you, you would register probably in your home state. So here you would register with HMRC for VATMOS. And this registration would allow you to submit the VAT data through that one tax authority who then distribute the information and the payments to the other tax authorities where your customers are. 
Um, but please remember this only applies to e-services, um, the sale of e-services to private consumers and not to the sale of goods to private consumers, although there are now um, very kind of concrete plans to introduce VATMOS for the sale of goods in 2021. And really VATMOS for um, digital services was a pilot scheme to see how this would work and try and make life easier for online retailers, whatever they are selling. Next slide, please. So that was really looking at um, selling services to businesses, selling services to private consumers, and selling services, uh, e-services to private consumers. And now I'm going to move on to looking at selling goods within the European Union um, to private, um, not to private, sorry, to businesses. So there is no obligation for you, um, if you're the supplier to VAT register in another EU country if certain criteria are fulfilled. And these are very specific EU, EU rules. So the criteria are, number one, your customer is a VAT registered business with a valid VAT number. Again, check the number on VISE. And again, if it's not showing up because your customer is in Spain or Italy or has a VAT number there, you can go and ask them for proof of the registration. You put this VAT number on your invoice with an obligatory phrase, intra-EU dispatch of goods, customers liable to account for VAT. And then there won't be any VAT on that invoice. You also need to retain proof that the goods left the UK and went to an EU customer. Again, there's additional paperwork, um, completing the relevant boxes on the VAT return, producing an EC sales list, which has to be filed with the tax authority. And also you need to keep an eye on interest at declaration thresholds, um, which I am going to go into a little bit more depth later on. Um, so you just need to be aware of the different rules and regulations. Next slide, please. So that's really kind of selling B2B in the EU. It's very simple. It's supposed to not be a burden on businesses. That And shop internationally you're governed by what's called the eu vat distance selling rules now these rules apply even if you're not VAT registered in the uk and even if you're a sole trader and they also apply if you're using the marketplaces such as ebay and amazon to sell to consumers you might think you might be sat in your bedroom packing your boxes and it, um, the kind of societal rules of taxation don't apply to you they absolutely do also be aware that EB and Amazon and the, and the likes of marketplaces, they do not take responsibility for the VAT on behalf of the seller if you are the owner of the goods. Um, do not be fooled, it's absolutely down to you. And be aware that these rules apply to your sales just to EU private consumers. If you've got customers outside the EU, these rules do not apply. There's a different set of rules which I'll touch upon a little later. So, um, yeah, change slide, brilliant. So what exactly are the distance selling rules? Um, the rules state that VAT should be charged locally until the VAT registration threshold set by each EU tax authority are exceeded in that country in a calendar year. Most countries, it's 35,000 euros or the equivalent. Um, there's three countries where it's 100,000 euros, Germany, Netherlands and Luxembourg. And the UK has a threshold of £70,000, which was, at the time the rules were set, probably the equivalent to €100,000. So, for example, if you're using a German warehouse to sell to customers in the UK, you don't have to register for UK VAT until you hit £70,000 worth of, of sales. Um, next slide, please. So really, to put it in perspective, especially if you've got medium to high value goods, it's not going to take um, much to breach the smaller thresholds in a lot of the European countries. And as I said, we've got a high local um, threshold here in the UK of £85,000. So it might not be unusual for you not to be that registered here, but say you've got a niche market in France and Spain, but you would have um, VAT registrations in either, either of those countries. It's not unheard of at all. Next slide, please. 
So I'm just going to talk you through uh, an example. For example, here, let's say you're selling mobile phone covers to Hungary. To start with, your sales are just getting going well below the Hungarian threshold of the Florence equivalent of 35,000 euros. At this point, you're charging UK VAT, unless, of course, you're not that registered here. In, if this is the case, don't charge VAT prior to the Hungarian threshold being reached. So you're charging UK VAT, you're approaching the Hungarian threshold, sales are going really well. Um, and you know they're going to continue to rise. As you're just about to cross threshold, you need to VAT register in Hungary. You need, you're going to need to be charging Hungarian VAT, either at their standard rate, it's the highest in Europe at 27%, or a reduced rate of VAT if it's applicable for your particular goods. Once registered, um, you then need to file periodic VAT returns, which in Hungary is monthly. Um, other countries, Germany, it's monthly. France, it's monthly. Um, Spain, it's quarterly, so you really need to know the different the different frequencies, and also each country has different deadlines. With VAT um, across Europe, it's kind of one set of rules being interpreted, 28 different ways, but it's very uh, ways, but it's very much a variation on the theme. And you stay registered. So once you're registered in Hungary, you need to be reporting every month, and you stay registered as long as your distance sales exceed threshold every year. If your sales drop off, um, and you need to deregister, you will be able to do so, but how quickly you can does depend on the local rules and regulations. Next slide, please. And really, if um, you've kind of been avoiding um, the VAT, international VAT obligations in terms of distance sales, please don't think you can go on under the radar for much longer. If you exceed threshold and fail to register, you can get hit with significant penalties and interest payments. Um, there's very much a spotlight at the moment on non-compliant sellers currently throughout the EU, and especially by the German and UK tax authorities. Um, the UK alone um, is reportedly losing 1.5 billion a year through um, non-compliant sellers, and the EU it's calculated about 163 billion euros a year. To stop the hemorrhaging, special measures have been put in, and they are um, and they are focusing again and again and doing more and more to really clamp down on non-compliant online sellers. Tax authorities, um, we've got cases where they've actually um, told Amazon to stop shops trading and to get the seller to remove their goods, otherwise they'd be disposed of unless the seller can prove that they're VAT compliant. Um, the heat has really been turned up. And in Germany, uh, we've had information that the German tax authorities are physically going into, for example, Amazon warehouses and seizing stock from sellers they believe aren't compliant. So online sellers really need to be very aware of their tax obligations in the countries where their customers are. Um, it is becoming business critical now. And unfortunately, ignorance is, is no defense at all. We've had conversations with HMRC they said, you know, maybe a couple of years ago, there wasn't so much um, education out there, but now it really wouldn't kind of stand up if you're not complying with local VAT rules. Okay, next slide, please. So in terms of practicalities, of process practicalities, you really need to make sure you've got the systems in place to capture accurate information, including where your, your, which countries your customers are at. You need to make sure you include shipping, delivery costs, um, as these are included in the final sums in terms of actually calculating for the distance selling thresholds. Um, and you also, you need to make sure that you add VAT to the shipping costs, as well as the product price on your invoices. Now, VAT on the shipping costs follows the VAT rate on the supply of the goods. Next slide, please. Also, again, importantly, know what VAT rates apply to your goods or services. Don't make the assumption that because a good has a certain VAT rate here, it's going to be the same um, elsewhere. Children's clothing is a really good example. Um, it's zero rated here and in Ireland, um, but elsewhere it will attract VAT. Don't do your sums and margins without knowing the VAT rates of your goods in the local market. Once you are registered somewhere else, don't charge UK VAT as well on those sales. You cannot account for VAT um, in two places on the same sale. 
And I'm just going to kind of touch a little bit on pricing, and I'm really sorry if I'm kind of teaching your grandma to suck eggs, but um, it really is kind of good information to plan ahead when you're setting your pricing. Does one price fit all? VAT rates vary across Europe, um, standard rates from 17 to 27%. So can the margins you've set for your products absorb the variations if you had to then VAT register somewhere else for whatever reason? And it's always a really good idea to do market research in your chosen markets, find out how you compare to local suppliers, <coughs> excuse me, and how much leeway this, this is going to give you. Um, we've had cases of, of people having to VAT register um, for whatever reason in another country. Um, and with um, goods that have small margins, it's really made them uncompetitive. And after a lot of hard work, they've, they've just not been able to sustain it. Next slide, please. So once you do start the process to register, um, the practicalities of obtaining European VAT registration really differs from country to country. It can take four to six weeks to obtain a VAT registration depending on the country that you're registered in, registering in. And as I said, there's different frequencies of VAT rates, different deadlines when you need to submit the returns and pay the money owed. And if you're late, you get um, interest charges for um, late VAT returns being filed, for late payments happening, etc. So you really need to keep on top of it. And these interest and pe penalties, they are automatically issued. Um, and they can be appealed, but it's really best to stay ahead of the game. And also, um, when your sales are growing, you really not need to start thinking about filing interest at reports. Now, interest at declarations, um, they actually stand for intra-community statistics and they are used by the EU tax authorities to actually monitor the health of the different EU countries and they also used to, for example, they can set a country's interest rates, etc. because they keep them to, to monitor, as I said, the economic health of the different territories. Um, uh, they're used to record the movement of goods between the countries as well. And if you don't file them, it's actually a criminal offence, but there's no actual um, monetary impact. It's a reporting requirement. Now, different countries have different interest at thresholds for what they call arrivals and dispatches. And these are EU terms basically for intra-community imports and exports. Um, so, yeah, you need to really understand the thresholds, stay ahead of the game with distance selling thresholds and with interest at thresholds. So another, um, if you can change the slide, please. Another area where there's um, lack of information, but it's starting to um, really become relevant. Um, again, especially if you're familiar with Amazon's infrastructure across Europe, there's a, a lot, there has been a, a massive amount of lack of information and knowledge about it. But if you use a fulfillment center or thinking about using it, you really need to be aware that the movement of goods um, into that fulfillment center by you as a non-resident triggers an immediate need to VAT register there. There are no thresholds to exceed. And the fulfillment center, unless they're buying the goods off you, which usually they aren't, um, they don't take ownership of the goods. So it really is, again, down to you, the seller, to be VAT compliant and to understand the local rules and regulations. And we work with many people um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Amazon Pan EU service. It triggers seven VAT registrations across the EU. Um, and you can um, trigger it with the tick with one tick box in the Amazon Seller Central account, and it triggers these these obligations, something like 64 VAT returns a year, EC sales lists, control statements, etc. Um, and the tax authorities are, are asking Amazon for data and people are really getting caught out with not being compliant. So it's really important to understand when you're starting to trade in other countries, just what are your obligations. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to touch on this quickly. Um, I don't know if it's relevant for, um, there might be some fulfillment companies out there or if, you're, if you know some fulfillment companies, HMRC are introducing a fulfillment due diligence scheme um, registration starts in April this year and it's really an attempt to make headway on non-compliant sellers here in the UK 
HMRC. Um, they want the fulfillment houses to register on the scheme and um, the fulfillment houses are then to be responsible for auditing who are using their space in the fulfillment houses and they need to make sure they're compliant if um, it's the fulfillment houses obligation to try and highlight the issues to probably the overseas sellers using the fulfillment centers make them that compliant and also to let HMRC know if a customer is using it that is not compliant and HMRC ultimately want fulfillment companies to stop working with non-compliant kind of overseas sellers. Um, it's going to be um, compulsory for fulfillment companies to sign up to this and to keep records and to liaise with HMRC and failure to do so will attract penalties. So it's something that's coming in this year that should be fully up and running by April next year. So next slide, yep, thank you. Um, so now um, that's really covering all the rules inside the EU. And I'm gonna talk to you just um, about selling goods to customers in non-EU countries. So generally speaking, <clears throat> excuse me, you can zero rate supplies exported outside the European Union, provided you follow strict rules. Um, for goods, you really need to provide proof um, evidence of export to show that the goods have left the EU. You, and also, where are your goods going to? Um, multiple countries out there and different rules and regulations are going to apply to each and every one of them. So find out exactly what your obligations are. Should the goods be with the goods, will you get charged um, import duties and taxes as um, a non-EU company would if they came, if they imported into the EU? Or you really need need to know exactly exactly what's going to affect you again because it can become business critical next slide please so if you're selling services to businesses in non-eu countries um, VAT is usually accounted for where the customer is based therefore it's outside the scope of UK VAT unless um, the use and enjoyment rule applies um, certain services such as hire, the hire of uh, movable goods and B2B e-services to non-EU customers if used and enjoyed say in the UK then the place of supply would be in the UK therefore UK VAT is due on the service so again get advice on what actually applies to your service if you're unclear next slide please so B2C services to non-EU customers um, should attract VAT um, in the country of establishment of the supplier. However, there's certain B2C services supplied to non-EU customers that are taxed where the customer is based. Now, these services um, are outside the scope of UK VAT and they cover such things as advertising, accountants, lawyers, consultants, financial um, ad advice, etc. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to just talk to you really about um, the potential effect of Brexit on the VAT obligations I've just spoken to you about. Um, and the government announced recently that we will leave the single market and the customs union. Um, so th the next few slides really are touching on the impact of that on um, selling your goods internationally. Next slide, please. So currently, as I've talked you through, especially with the B2B sales, there's free trade, there's no obligation to VAT register as long as certain criteria is fulfilled. There's reporting requirements um, so the government can cross-check um, and make sure no, no kind of fraud is going on intra-community. And there's also at the moment the opportunity to access simplification um, mechanisms such as triangulation which can um, avoid a supply by having to register again in multiple countries so that's the situation as it is now next slide please so once we are outside the EU any transactions to customers in other EU member states will become imports and exports um, and this is the terminology used for bringing goods in and outside of the EU Obviously, the great news is you won't have to do EC sales lists and interest declarations, um, but these will be replaced with import and export and customs documents 
You also won't be able to ac um, access the simplification measurements such as triangulation, domestic reverse charge, etc. So any exports that you make now to, they would be exports to your EU business customers will be zero rated and you will not charge UK VAT on those exports. However, your EU customers are going to have to pay input charges on the goods that you're sending to them. On the other hand, if you're importing from EU suppliers, you're now going to have to pay import charges on those supplies. And um, the VAT element you will be able to reclaim on your local VAT return, but it is going to have cash flow implications for you. Um, so it's not going to be as seamless as it actually is now. And you'd probably have to use a freight forwarder or customers broker to actually um, facilitate your goods coming in and out of the country. And also there's some EU countries, France, Poland, for example, um, Italy, that require fiscal representation for non-EU companies. And these rules would then apply to UK businesses. You would have to um, appoint a fiscal rep and a fiscal rep is somebody who is jointly and severally liable for the VAT owed. Often it's increased costs and um, bank guarantees are put in place obviously to negate any risk for the fiscal rep um, to end up holding um, a big VAT bill if you decide you don't want to pay. So they put measurements, they put um, procedures in place to make sure they're not exposed. Next slide please. So now back to looking at um, B2B, selling B2B services. At the moment, if you're the supplier, VAT um, comes under the reverse charge mechanism. The EC sales list has to be completed and sales to non-EU buyers are outside the scope of UK VAT. Next slide, please. So after Brexit, as with now, um, if you as a UK business are supplying services, to example, a USA customer, the VAT is outside the scope of UK VAT um, and it just gets reported as a sale on the UK VAT return. But you, you won't be applying the reverse charge and you don't have to worry about EC sales lists. In terms of um, you as a non-EU company now receiving services from an EU supplier, um, you'll probably receive an invoice without VAT. Um, so that should make um, life a bit easier that way around in terms of services. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to look at the um, provision of selling goods to private consumers post-Brexit. Now really, um, the income from VAT generated from online sales is revenue that a tax authority gets to keep because the burden of VAT is with the final customer. It's a great revenue earner for the tax authorities and um, the UK tax authority as well. They probably will, we think, look to protect, protect this income by legislating for special rules when UK companies sell to EU citizens. Um, but all things being equal, after Brexit, the goods from the UK um, would now be imported to EU private consumers. Import charges would be applied to those goods as we've um, lost the free movement. One of two things can happen. Either, either the customer needs to account for the VAT. So just before the goods get delivered, the customer will receive an email, say from DHL, asking the customer to pay the import VAT and duties. Um, I don't know if you've experienced this, um, maybe buying trainers or jeans from the United States. And before they actually get delivered, you would get an email um, from customs asking for the import VAT and duties to be paid before they'd be delivered. And it's not really the best customer experience and can result in large numbers of goods being returned to the seller. Um, or alternatively, the, you as the seller could VAT register in each country where your customer is and um, account for the VAT so the customer has a, has a better buying experience. Another option would be to use a warehouse or fulfillment center in one of the EU countries, um, import your goods into there, and then be able to leverage the EU VAT distance selling rules. So you might put your goods in France and then you could sell to private consumers in Spain, Italy, Germany, et cetera, using um, the distance selling threshold. And you would only have to register in the other countries when you exceeded those thresholds. But um, really there's an impact on cash flow um, 
in terms of, as I said, importing um, possible import charges, use of local warehouses, the cost involved in that, and of course, using fiscal representatives when local rules apply. Next slide, please. In terms of the provision of non-digital services to private consumers, these are now accounted for where the supplier is based, as I mentioned previously. So for the supplier under the new rules, it's really, um, we're waiting to see really what a new VAT Act um, will consider um, in terms of the VAT obligations for those sales, and it's really hard to tell at the moment. Um, if you're selling digital services, to EU private consumers, you're gonna to have to apply for what's known as the non-union VATMOS registration. After Brexit, as a UK seller, you'll, you won't have access to the VATMOS system via the UK, and you'll have to choose another member state to register in, and you may need um, a local VATMOS agent, a fiscal rep, that's gonna um, act on your behalf. Um, so that's gonna mean a little bit more paperwork. Next slide, please. So really, um, to summarize, it's all about doing your homework. Um, you really need to understand there is a cost of compliance. Um, I think this is becoming more accepted these days. You really need to factor it into your cash flow along with other staples like web hosting or accountancy fees. Um, and planning and preparation is really a vital part of the journey. However, many businesses who've already made the leap to international expansion find the cost of compliance is far outweighed by the opportunities, increased sales, increased profit. Um, it's really um, an exciting time and such an opportunity in this day and age to be able to sell it internationally and see that vision for your businesses. Next slide, please. So um, what we do, we obviously um, provide international VAT registrations in the 28 EU countries and other territories like Canada, for example, where local laws prevail. We can do the ensuing VAT returns, the um, other reporting requirements like EC sales lists. And in other countries, um, like in Czech Republic, there's control statements to file on a monthly basis, et cetera. So we can cover all those for you if they become relevant. Um, and also we have good partners um, in the supply chain. So um, if you're selling internationally and you have a question away from VAT and don't know who to ask, you can always ask us. We might just know somebody we can point you in the right direction. Next slide, please. So what we're really saying to you is just don't drown under international VAT obligations. We're obviously here to help. Um, we want you to concentrate on your core business and we'll take the pain away for you. Next slide, please. Um, and as William uh, mentioned at the start, um, we're really proud um, to today launch our bite-sized chunks in partnership with the Institute of Export, um, the International VAT Essentials, which will go towards your continual profession development points. Um, and William's going to give you more details about that in a few moments. Next slide, please. So that's it, really. Um, high level view and what you really need to think about. As I said, it might be a bit um, a bit dry to take in all at once, but just really want to signpost you in the right directions and give you food for thought um, when you come across different scenarios trading internationally. Thank you. Thank you, William. Thank you, Claire. Um, th many thanks for such a succinct yet um, thorough overview of international VAT. And it's been, as you allude to, it's definitely one we'll look to revisit as well following Brexit. Um, we're now going to open the floor for questions. So please do ask questions using the control panel on the right hand side. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of um, people seeking clarification, a couple of points, Claire. Um, so one person has asked, Regarding the Hungary example, it shows UK VAT at 20% both before and after exceeding the Hungarian VAT registration threshold. Is that the right understanding or, is that, is, or can you clarify that? Yep, sorry, it, it, yeah, it, it, just a, um, a visual of the slide. No, you charge UK VAT at 20% on those sales to Hungarian customers until you hit the threshold and your Hungarian VAT registration is in place. At that point, any sales to Hungarian customers 
is at 27% and you stop charging UK VAT and you start charging Hungarian VAT just on that local on those local Hungarian sales. Thank you. Um, hopefully that's that's helped. And one from Jessica who's asked um, if you could clarify in terms of e-services, do things like word processing services, copy editing, typesetting, etc., would these be counted as e-services? So I guess a, a bit of a top level kind of def definition of e-services would be great, please. Yeah, e-services really cover um, downloads and services that don't have a very, very minimal human intervention. So in terms of what Jessica was asking, um, it's really to understand the service that is supplied, how it's supplied. Um, if it's an automatic download, I'm not quite sure exactly what services Jessica's talking about. If it's an automatic download, it's probably an e-service. If you, uh, maybe as, as uh, I don't know, somebody that's um, producing a piece of typed work for somebody that wouldn't be classed as an e-service because there would be a lot of human intervention, intervention in preparing that draft. Thank you. And uh, a question just in from Sue, who's asked if you could say a little bit more about VAT and duty requirements for selling alcohol in, alcohol in small quantities in a B2C context. Um, we've got a big food, food and drink following. So yeah, just a bit um, about VAT and duty for alcohol, please. Yeah, there's, um, there's, there's different rules to do with alcohol. So um, there's excise duty involved as well. And I think you have to look at the, it's, they have the different rules and regulations in each country, but I think you have to register immediately for the excise duty. Um, but it's not, I can find out for sure um, and let um, the questioner know, but it's, the, the rules are different, especially with, well, only with, with alcohol are, are different. So there might be an immediate obligation because of the excise duty impact. Thank you. And yeah, we um we can take a couple of these offline afterwards as well. And one thing to note, actually, is that we started uh, after the last Brexit webinar, we put a couple of the most frequently asked questions on the site afterwards with answers. So keep an eye out for those. Um, a question in from Peter. He's asked, is Switzerland classed as an EU country or non-EU country in terms of VAT? It's a non-EU country. Um, so if you, for example, you export to Switzerland and if you've got goods in Switzerland, you're importing into the EU um, as well. Um, and in Switzerland, you require fiscal representation. If you're creating valuable supplies there as an EU company, um, you would need a fiscal rep there. It's definitely um, classed as outside the EU. Thank you. And uh, a question now in from Paul. He said uh, regarding Amazon, and we had a couple sent in advance about Amazon as well. He said that he's um, under the VAT threshold, but on Amazon fulfillment, um, sorry, under the free VAT threshold, but on Amazon fulfillment would be, so I'm just trying to be real discussion. So they are under the VAT threshold, but on Amazon fulfillment would be on sale in Germany. So how do they register? Um, if, if I understand, so um, as I understand, he from if he's using Amazon fulfillment in Germany, this triggers an immediate need to VAT register in Germany. There is no, you, you don't worry about the 100,000 euro distance selling threshold, your stock's in Germany, the German tax authority required to VAT register straight away. Um, and obviously that's, that's something we can help with. Um, if, if needs be, but this is the point. If you, if you, as I touched on with the slides on fulfillment, if you have your stock in a EU country as a non-resident, it triggers an immediate need to VAT register there. If you're selling to private consumers, um, so it's really important to understand those rules before you expose, before you, you know, you start trading. Are you going to generate enough sales to really um, account for the VAT, etc., and pay for the compliance? Thank you. Thank you, Claire. And yeah, sorry about my site garbling on that question. Um, one from Sarah. She's asked, on goods exported, are there specific invoice requirements for each country or is there a standard across all exported goods? Um, in terms of there are different rules and regulations for the different countries. Some require compulsory invoicing and some don't, depending on the type of service or goods supplied. Um, there is a, a core basic 
invoice template, if you like. They have to have a sequential number that, has to, that which allows an audit trail, the date, um, the net amount, the VAT amount, the gross amount, etc. But we can provide a template, um, a kind of generic template. And again, then there's different um, specifics for some countries, but it, it's pr pretty much generic. Thank you. Um, and another question, this is a feedback question, but it's, it's generally to do with um, zero rating. And it's, uh, how do you zero rate when you sell goods to non-EU countries? Do you have to VAT register to do so? And can you sell to non-VAT customers, as in individuals, without charging VAT? Or is it sorry, individuals, not individuals? Could you just say that again for me, William? Sorry. Sure. So it's, how do you zero rate when you sell goods to non-EU countries? Do you have to VAT register to do so? And can you sell to non-VAT customers, as in individuals, without charging VAT? Yeah, if if you're if you're not VAT registered, you cannot you you know your your transactions will not contain VAT anyway. So you're under the threshold. Say in the UK, you cannot charge VAT because there's no mechanism to report or collect it. So you're, if you're selling to a non-EU customer, the sale would not have VAT on it anyway if you're, if you're not registered. Um, and that's true, again, if you're, again, to non-VAT registered customers, if you're not VAT registered, you can't charge VAT. If you are VAT registered, um, you, um, on your invoice to your non -EU, EU customers, you the invoice should um, contain that the VAT is zero rated, and um, you don't put VAT on it, and it gets reported on your VAT return. But if you're selling to um, consumers um, in Europe, for example, you have to add VAT. You need to put VAT on the invoice. But as I touched on, there's, there's slightly different rules and regulations with the types of services supplied. But generally, if somebody's not VAT registered and you are, you need to put VAT on the invoice if you're VAT registered, but they won't have a mechanism to reclaim it. Thank you, Claire. Uh, you're doing extremely well to questions and we're still getting a couple in. So I'll put, up, I'll put forward another one from Sally, who's asked, if you are holding goods in a fulfillment center in Germany, who will be selling B2B, do you still need to register for VAT in Germany before you reach for, reach for threshold? Yes. Yes. Again, um, because your goods are in, in Germany, um, some countries have um, what's called the domestic reverse charge, but I'm 99% I'm sure G Germany is not one of those, but I can triple check when we get offline. But I would say, yes, you do have to register even if you've got B2B sales. Thank you. And uh, a question which was sent in advance, um, which you may have touched on earlier, but we'll just put it again just to make sure, from Paul, who's asked, if you sell food and beverages via Amazon Fulfillment, do you need to register for VAT in each country? Um, yeah, it, it really depends on the Amazon Fulfillment service that you subscribe to. They do have different services. There's something called the European Fulfillment Network. Um, which means you would put your stock in one country and you would actually be selling your stock via, say, Amazon.de, Amazon.es, etc. Um, but the goods would be sent from the one warehouse, say, in the UK. Um, and that would mean you would just have one VAT registration to start with and then you could leverage the distance selling rules. Or if you used Amazon's PanEU fulfillment service, you would need seven VAT registrations in place straight away because you would have your goods in France, Germany, Italy, Spain, um, Poland and Czech Republic and the UK. Um, so you need the VAT registrations in place and then any sales from each location would be governed by the distance selling rules. So it's really understanding which Amazon fulfillment service that you've signed up for to understand your exact obligations. But there would be, you, you wouldn't need to VAT register if you want, depending on the ones you were subscribed to. Thanks, Claire. And one last question, which is, again, I think just seeking clarification. Um, and it's, if we, if we currently sell under the threshold in an EU country, will we need for local VAT registration? I'm sorry, I missed the first bit. Could you say it again? I'm really sorry. Uh, so it's just another, another one for clarification. And it's, if we currently sell under the threshold in an EU country, will we need for local VAT registration? 
Um, if you, it, it depends where your country of residence is. Again, it depends where your stock is, etc. It depends kind of on the circumstances. Um, if you're not resident, again, if you're a UK company with stock in Germany, you think you're under the German threshold, you have to that register because your stock is there um, if you're selling um, to private consumers. So it really depends on the circumstances and where you're set up. Do you have a company established, for example, in Germany? Um, there's, there's loads of kind of different different scenarios. So it's really about kind of just finding out um, specific information about your specific circumstances. Thank you, thank you, Claire. And uh, we've had, I think it's the last question we've had, and we've had a lot of questions, but this might be the last one. From Lotta, who asks, if I am VAT registered, do I need to charge VAT on goods sold B2B to another EU country? Um, if you, add, um, this is covered in the presentation, um, but absolutely no problem saying it again. If you get a valid VAT number from your business customer, and again, you can check it on VIES, V I E S, which is the European Commission website that holds a database of all the EU businesses' VAT numbers. Um, as I said, apart from a couple of countries, Italy and Spain, where they don't always show up because of their internal processes. If your customer is a business with a valid VAT number, you do not charge VAT. You issue an invoice with an obligatory phrase stating it's an intra EU supply of goods and um, the customer accounts for the VAT. But you do need to fill out what's an EC sales list, which lists the customer's VAT number. Um, and that gets submitted and that's used by the tax authorities to make sure no fraud is 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 taking place and everything is um, it's a way of auditing and making sure the compliance is correct. Thank you, Claire. And I think on that note, I think we're going to wrap up. So thank you so much for what was um, certainly a very lively Q&A. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the questions. And um, yeah, thank you once again, Claire. And I hope everyone has found today useful. Thank you, William. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Claire. And um, as mentioned in the webinar, I'd like to draw everyone's attention to the Bite Size Chunks page on the Institute's website, on which you'll find the new VAT learning modules, which Claire has worked with us on. Um, that can be found at export.org.uk, Bite Size Chunks. And as you can see, there's modules there on international VAT, international VAT rules for supply of goods, international VAT rules for supply of services, and another module on recovery rules in the EU member states. We've got a couple of events coming up with the Institute this spring, which you might like to know a little bit about. We're back on the road with our regional trade summits, starting with Newcastle on March 13th. All Northeast businesses and beyond should certainly come along to that. And we're also hosting our graduation ceremony for our recent successful students in May. This is taking place in London and is a great opportunity to meet the future of international trade and many key figures from Trade Today. So details for all of the Institute's events can be found at export.org.uk forward slash events. Our next webinar is on customs and duties and the essentials you need to know as a new exporter. That takes place on March 1st and you can find details about signing up to that session and our general plans for 2008 at opentexport.com forward slash webinars. As always, please take our exit survey to, to let us know what you thought of today's webinar and to give us any suggestions for improvements or future topics. But many thanks and goodbye.